Okay, I think we've got everybody who we will have today. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, if you can't, oh, well, we've, got, uh, we've got somebody in the chat. I'll just double check. You can't hear anything. Vicky has just said she can't hear. Vicky, can you hear me now? Yes, really. Okay. Right. Technical issues. So, um, right, we'll get the session started. Hopefully, the title of the session you're expecting today is the title on the screen there. It should say on your screen, um, play-based approaches to teaching those with severe learning difficulties in autism. If it doesn't, um, I will please tell me now and we will get this sorted straight away. Um, but what I'm going to do today is go through a bit of an introduction. I'm going to talk a bit about play. I'm going to give you the context of Sunningdale School, um, how play is used here, explain a little bit about the school and, and how we came to using a pedagogy which is predominantly play-based. I'm going to talk about why we value play as an approach in the setting to such a high degree and, and what it is about play specifically that we're looking to, to use and what we're trying to develop with our pupils. Then I'm going to talk about stages and types of play, um, specifically those that we use here at Sunningdale and how and why we go about using or looking at or developing those particular stages and types of play and talk about some of the mechanisms we use here at Sunningdale. Absolutely, there would be no expectation that that's what somebody else would do. But in terms of just sharing how that process works in its fullest form, I will share some of how we do that here. And then just point people in the direction of if you want to explore this subject deeper or um, specific aspects of it in a little more detail and depth. What I will do today is probably give people a massive amount of information in a relatively short space of time. It is possible that in the future we will run sessions that will follow up this session that will break different aspects of what I'm going to talk about today in the smaller steps, but I'm going to give you very much an overview and quite a lot of information about our play-based pedagogy and just play in general as well. So in terms of introduction, so my name is James Waller. I'm the head teacher here at Sunningdale School. We are a school for children with severe, profound and multiple learning difficulties, significant number of which also have autism. So in terms of our school, we are, just as a lot of SLD, PMLD schools are, we are roughly 140 children, 110 or so members of staff, and we have roughly about 65%, 60% of the school have autism, and what would be considered by somebody like Peter Imre to have complex learning difficulties. So that is severe le levels of cognition, with very, very complex communication and interaction needs. So that's the kind of context of the school. We're based in Sunderland in Tyne and Weir, if anybody's particularly interested in where the school is based. We're just off the, the A19, one of the major roads that runs from North Yorkshire up, um, kind of into Northumberland. So, In terms of the school itself, what I'm going to do is set a bit of context for you about why we work, how we work, and this is the kind of first step in doing that. So if I go back about six or seven years, um, we we did some work with parents, governors, um, staff, pupils themselves, and, and really any other stakeholder we could get hold of as a school. Oh, hang on. I've got a question. To make sure it's... Sorry, I'm having issues with microphone to you. I'm just going to log off and back in. Apologies. Oh, Vicky again. Right. We've lost Vicky. We may get her back. Hopefully we do. Um. So, yeah, if I go back about six or seven years, we grabbed all of the stakeholders that we could that have anything to do with the school. And what we did was we asked them what skills, qualities, abilities, characteristics would they want a child who attends Sunningdale School, whether that be their child or a child they teach, or if they were a governor, just a child they were interested in, or what, what skills, qualities, attributes would they want that child to have by the time they left the school? 
what we had was we had in groups of four or five, we had pair all of these different stakeholders draw a child. And if you, you can see any, any of what's on the screen right now, you'll see they weren't the greatest of artists, um, but they drew children and then they plotted around the outside or the inside of that child, the kind of skills and um, attributes, et cetera, they wanted the child to have by the time they left the school. I've got a couple that are slightly larger and a little more zoomed in. We have about 60 or 70 of these, each of which were made by three or four adults. Here comes Vicky, hopefully. Is that any better, Vicky? Can you hear that? Is the sound working for you? Maybe. Oh, now we've got IT coming. Right, okay. So, yeah, so we had, they plotted out these. We have about 60 or 70 of these. And currently, if you if you did visit the school, you would see we have these displayed around the school to remind the staff in the school that this is what we're trying to do. And what we found, what was really interesting about going through this process was that the the types of things that our stakeholders were writing were these. So they were really interested in children developing social skills, being better regulated, being more resilient, uh, being problem solvers, communicating their needs and feelings, being safe, um, being independent and being healthy. What we found was if we if you go through the 60 or so of these posters, they're kind of A2 size, quite large posters. If you go through those, these are the most common phrases, the most common words, the most common kind of attributes that reappear across all of those posters with these things. It was absolutely fascinating to us that nobody, not a single person had written anything about kind of being able to write their name or being able to sign their signature or anything like that. There were all of these kind of skills around operating in the real world, these very functional kind of attributes that they were going to need to be in and around the real world. And what we did at the time, and we started looking at over the time that we were considering how to use that information, is we started to reflect on the fact that they really closely reflected the preparation for adulthood outcomes that people are looking for. So being able to be in good health, you know, having friends, having relationships, playing a role in community, being as independent as possible in your everyday life and and using that all of those things functionally in the real world. Now, whether that be to go into employment or whether that just be to kind of functionally operate in and around the real world on a weekend, in the school holidays, on an evening, or certainly by the time that you were actually an adult. So we were reflecting on this, and as a result of this, we started to draw together a slightly different vision for the school, and, and that started with this kind of vision statement, which you will have seen, if you've been on schools' websites, everybody has some version of this vision. It's very, they're very, very similar, but what we wanted to do was be very explicit about never underestimating the child's potential but recognizing at the same time that their aspirations would be very different and individual to them because every child is really different and individual that attends the school. And because of that, we started looking at ways of really personalizing every child's targets, their curriculum, their assessment and their outcomes so that they were all really individual to the child. What you would find if you actually attended the school is we we have a snappier way of saying this rather than the, the kind of vision statement that sits on the website. And it's we talk about the children being more. We talk about every child being more in whatever way is important to them and being more by the time they leave the school than they were when they first arrived. And that might look different to every single child. If you think about preparation for adulthood and everything that that encompasses or preparation for life beyond the school, we realize that for the children, it will be that be more could be more anything. It might be more friendly, to be more safe, to be more independent, to be more resilient, to be more expressive, to be more communicative. That will be different for every single child that attends the school. And it might also be different from year to year, from term to term, possibly even as much as from day to day, depending on what's going on in that any given day. So that's how we started to then 
quite a few years ago, articulate the school's vision and what we were trying to do for the child. So this is the context from which our curriculum was developed. And when I get into the play-based pedagogy, it will hopefully make sense of why we use that and how we use that. The starting point for this kind of context and the, the individualization beginning is the arrangement of our curriculum and the way that our curriculum pathways work across the school. So at our early years foundation stage, we have very mixed classes where we're looking at the needs of the pupils. We have a heavy emphasis on understanding how they engage how in terms of their areas of engagement, but also their engagement motivators. And I will talk about that a little bit later on. Um, we certainly have done sessions in the past about how the school uses engagement and they're often very heavily attended. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I will talk about it in the context of play and how we use that information. But then once they move out of the early years foundation stage, we have a what we call a pre-formal pathway for children um, who are very early in their developmental skills in terms of cognition and communication. We have what we call our explore pathway, which is for children with very complex needs who are learning to engage with the kind of environment around them. And we're looking to seek um, better engagement, stronger communication, interaction with others and all of those types of skills. We have what we call our semi-formal play pathway, which is where we're looking for the functional application and cross-contextualization of skills that children have. And we have, um, on paper at least, we have a formal pathway where children will access formal subject-specific learning in the areas of, um, you know, maths, English, and so on. As I'm, I'm just going to do, I'm going to show you this. This is on our website. I don't expect anybody to kind of read this and just suddenly take this in. There's a lot of text on this, but it's just to illustrate the way that we define how learners are going to go into each of those pathways is quite multifaceted. So not only does the kind of curriculum look slightly different in each of those pathways and the outcomes we're seeking are slightly different, which I'll remind you of again in a moment, but the learner characteristics of how we decide how children are going to go into each of those pathways are based on a number of factors that the main overarching factors of which are these on the screen at the moment. So we look at the child's levels of communication and how they communicate. We look at their learning characteristics in terms of their levels of development and their developmental characteristics. We look very explicitly at their stage of play in, in terms of both their cognitive types of play that they're able to use and the social stages of play at which they're playing. And we look very specifically at that. And then we look at their ability to engage. How well do they engage? What does that actually look like? And then we look at their developmental levels. For ease, what we have on our website is this version of the developmental levels that has some older assessment systems on it. We, we have that for a very specific reason that sometimes when, or quite often, when we have children coming into the school, they're coming in with very outdated methods of assessment, things like P-scales, the old EYFS bandings, things like that. So this is there for ease of kind of parents and nursery settings and other settings being able to kind of judge roughly where the, the child's sitting at that time. We don't use these assessments ourselves in the school. I'll just be very clear about that. This is really there as an external aid to people. So that, that's how we decide who's going to go into each of the pathways. And you can probably see there on the screen that the pathways are then, sub, some of them are subdivided. So our explore pathway is split into informal explore and semi-formal explore. Um, our formal pathway is subdivided. And actually in the explore pathway itself, even the two sub pathways are divided. Each class has a slightly different version of what this looks like for each class. So we go into it. That's the level of depth we go into as we start to personalize what the, the approach for the children in the school looks like. But that's certainly not what today's is about. That's just there for context for you. And this is on the school's website if it's something you want to look at more in more depth. But just to remind you what we're talking about in our pre-formal pathway, the overarching goal of the pathway that we're seeking is autonomy. So we want the children to be as autonomous as possible. These are children with profound learning difficulties. We want them to be able to exert some influence on the environment around them in terms of that community. If you think about our end goal being community participation and some level of independence, 
We want these children to be able to exert their autonomy on the environment that they're in, whether that be through communicating their needs or, or some other action, and that's what we're seeking in that, that pathway. In our explore pathway, we, as I already talked about, we're trying to secure children who can engage with their learning, engage with the environment around them. And one of the big things we're seeking for those children is their ability to tolerate uncertainty. We want the children in that pathway with very complex learning difficulties. So often with SLD, but also um, you know autism and other factors that are impacting their communication and interaction skills. We want those children to be able to be in uncertain situations and feel comfortable in those situations, to be well-regulated, to feel safe, and to be able to apply what skills they've got. In our semi-formal pathway that we sometimes call semi-formal play, we want the children to be able to know what to do when they don't know what to do. So in this pathway, we are very focused on the functional application of skills. So whatever developmental level they're at in this pathway, where the children in this pathway usually already engage very well with their learning, engage very well with play and the environment around them. What we're looking for is for the child to be able to apply that learning to functional situations so it is useful to them in the, the real world. In that part of our school, we have a range of environments that are built for developing functional learning. We have a, an apartment. We have a shop, which I've, I've got some pictures of on the screen. We have a doctor's surgery. We have a beautician's that are all make up part of what we call the school's functional learning village. Um, the shop specifically is a truly functional learning environment. It's set up like a corner shop. It has the branding of a corner shop. It has real tills that it uses real money. And that's where all of the children go and buy their snack during the day for their morning snack. And they have to use real money. They have to look after it. They have purses. They have, you know, they have to be able to read the signage. They have to use the correct amounts of money, calculate their change, all of that kind of stuff. We have this kind of functional approach, even at year one, um, for our, some of our youngest children at five years old, six years old, we, we immediately put them into these functional learning environments and everything they're learning to do, all of the developmental skills that they're acquiring, we, we test them and push them to use those functionally. Oh. Just got a message. Vicky is not. Vicky in. Do we have one in? I must have been able to go. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I keep having chat messages pop up on the screen. So yeah, we have this kind of functional approach. The other thing, the reason that you're here, that we use across all of our pathways is that we utilize a play-based pedagogy. So the school uses a play-based pedagogy, a play-based approach to learning across every pathway in the school. That includes um, at the pre-formal pathway, and we have a way of doing that in the pre-formal pathway, which I will touch on, um, all the way up through our other pathways, and we utilize a, a play-based approach to learning. So all of the majority of the learning in the school takes place through a play-based approach. And I'll hopefully um, be able to explain that as we go on. Just admitting two more people out of the waiting room, so we'll let them get in. Think I'm in. Right. Okay. So that's the context of the school. That's a little bit about how the school set up, which will hopefully of, of what we do and why we do it, how we do it, as I go on to talk about that. But in terms of that play-based approach, we've used that for approximately roughly about 11 years. 11, 12, 11, 12 years, we've used some version of play-based approach as the driving pedagogy in the school. Okay, so why, why play is what we're going to go on to talk about. We've covered the context of the school. Why do we play? Okay, so this is why we play. So if you can take in the picture that's on the screen there, this is a really common kind of site, a common occurrence 
uh, or certainly was in my teaching career, if you work with children or young people as they start to get into key stage three, key stage four and key stage five, and you get into you know life skills learning and you want to start learning how to use shops, how to use transport, all of those big things that we need to operate in the real world. And my background for, you know, if I go back 10, 12 years before I was here at Sunningdale, I was working in key stage three and four and sometimes and earlier than that, key stage five. And, you know, we would take, we would prepare our children for life skills and we would we would do everything we could to get them out into the community. And it, especially at key stage four, this would start to become really, really important. And we would do a massive amount of work in teaching children to get transport down to the local shops. For me, it was a, a big one of those big Tesco extra like supermarkets. And we would take them down into the community, into the shop. And we would have done a load of work back in the classroom around what they were going to need for their cookery lesson. And we would be trying to make that as functional as possible. So we'd already abandoned the kind of idea of let's not make a gatto that uh, you know, nobody, even I back at home, wouldn't be able to make where I've got to follow some really elaborate recipe. We were already in a kind of functional like cooking and functional eating and, and functional food prep. So we were maybe just getting everything we needed to make a sandwich. We would have gone through what we needed for our sandwich, what we wanted in everybody's individual sandwich. We would write our shopping list. We might be using symbols for that. We, we would be writing it in whatever way was relevant to every child, the, the seven or so children maybe I was going to take to the shop. We would then do a load of work about how we got to the shop. We would get there. You know, we would get maybe the school minibus at first, but eventually we would be using the actual bus and we would have done a load of work around that as well. We would get down to the supermarket that wasn't that far away, trying to make this as functional as possible. We'd have done a load of work back in the school around using covering amounts of money and, and knowing, you know, how much we could afford and all of that kind of stuff. What we would have done, because we're really good at this in schools, is try to prepare the child for this. So rather than just throw them in the shop, we would have visited the supermarket several times, possibly tens and tens of times. We worked our route out around the supermarket. We would have explained this is where the bread is. That's where your spread's going to be. This is where your cheese will be. This is where your, you know, ham will be. This is, you know, we've gone around, we've checked that off. We've done little kind of almost orienteering visits where we're ticking off where everything is and that we can find it and everything. And then something really interesting happens in supermarkets that everybody will be aware of. And if you've ever seen me talk about play, engagement, attunement, emotional regulation, possibly mental health, or anything like that before you, I, you will have heard me use this example. But it's something happens in supermarkets approximately every couple of months, which then undermines all of that practice, which is that they rearrange where all of their aisles are. The only aisles that don't get rearranged are the refrigerated ones everything else gets moved around. Now they do this for a marketing purpose. It's very clever, you know, it moves around, then you have to kind of work out a new route around the supermarket. You go past lots of stuff you wouldn't ordinarily have looked for, and you end up putting it in your trolley. You impulse buy a load of chocolate because the chocolate's now in the aisle where the, you know, the bread used to be or whatever. So that that's what happens in supermarkets. What we used to then find though, is we had trained a child into working their way around the supermarket. And when they get to the aisle that's got, I don't know, the marmite, for example, in the jams, the jars, the spreads, and suddenly it's just full of cereal, we would then be dealing with a 17-year-old child with a severe learning difficulty in autism, who at this point is about six foot two and weighs 17 stone, starting to become dysregulated in the middle of a Tesco's because the marmite is not there and this was um it, it's embarrassingly common or was embarrassingly common when we used to do this is we would get down there and and you know we'd suddenly be dealing with that child and they would be starting to become dysregulated and you know on on the odd unlucky occasion some of that stuff was getting swiped off shelves um and you know kind of thrown down aisles and things like that 
And we would have to deal with that in the shop and you try to deal with that exactly how you would any other time when you're anywhere else where you're trying to re-regulate a child. Only this time you're in the middle of public. There's a lot of other stimulation going on. There's tannoys, there's other people. It's an unusual space. It's even more unusual now because every, they were used to it and everything's moved into a different place. Well, on reflection, we start to think about well, why does this happen? Well, it happens because of this. We run an ITT course here at Sunningdale. And one of the first things we ever talk to our initial teacher training students about is schema and schema theory. Thinking about how we map things into our long-term memory. So how do we store information and how do we make connections between different kind of concepts? You know, how do we start to understand that this thing is very similar to this thing. And if I know how to do this, then I know how to do that. Possibly the simplest version of this, or one of the simplest versions of this, would be understanding the, the relationship between cardinal and ordinal numbers. So if I know one, two, three, four, five, I know first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. It's the, I understand the relationship between the two because I know how to use one, I can use the other. We use it all the time. Um, another simple version of, of that, you know, cross-contextualization because that information is all linked together is something like your 10 times table because you can count to one, two, three, four, five. Again, you know that it just goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And we just, we do that really easily. A really simple illustration that we often use with our ITT students just to make it a bit more humorous for them is this. So while you're sat there on the end of the screen, if you've seen me talk about this before, you might have seen me use this example before and I use this a lot. So we talk to them about what is a cow? So we could think about a cow, you know, it has four legs, it's got a head, it's got a tail, as it is, it's, it's, it's yay high. You know, we kind of, we can sit and describe a cow. Well, one way that we can understand a cow if we don't have a concept of a lot of animals, and it's certainly one way that young children start to conceptualize the world, is, you know, a cow's like a really large dog that you kind of, you get milk out of. We can get milk out of this animal. It's kind of like, looks a bit like a dog, but it's much bigger, um, and it lives in the field. Then we can start to think about, well, if, if a dog's like a small cow, then what's a horse? So if we've never encountered a horse before, but we have a concept of the dog, we can start to understand, right, well, okay, maybe a horse is like a really fast dog that you can ride on. So we start, okay, that we, we understand that concept because we understand what a dog is. Giraffe. What is a giraffe? So a giraffe's a really unusual animal. It's it's a bit like a horse, really tall horse that has a very long neck. Some people would describe it as having a leg for a neck. That's what a giraffe is. It's like really tall horse and a leg for a neck. What would a zebra be? So whenever we describe what a zebra is to somebody who has no concept of a zebra, there's a very specific way we do this. It's a horse that supports Newcastle United. That's what it does. No, but seriously, it's a stripy horse. That's how we describe a zebra, isn't it? There is one animal that I often in training will put in front of people and only ever hear the same way of describing this animal. How do people describe this animal to a small child that they who has never encountered this animal before? Because they're not going to encounter it in real life, obviously. A hairy elephant. Nobody ever describes a mammoth as anything different than a hairy elephant. But because we understand what an elephant is, we do understand what a mammoth is or would look like. And this is the simplest. I mean, it's so simple that it's almost wrong. But it's the simplest kind of explanation of how schema theory works in the sense of how we make sense of the world around us. We take our understanding of one thing and we apply it to another thing. That is taken for granted in the most extreme way with this product. This is the most common consumer product in the world. So this is an iPhone. Um, for those of you on Samsung, this is what the Apple phone looks like. But this is, so this is the most common consumer product or one of the most common consumer products in the world. And it's a really great illustration of what I've just been talking about. 
and how it is taken for granted. As I've said several times now, this is one of the most common products in the world. When you open its box, there is something very unusual about this product. Apart from the fact that it's all pretty and everything in the box looks really pretty and opens in a certain way. There's something not in the box, which you would expect with a product this complex would be quite important. When you open an iPhone, there are no instructions for an iPhone in its box. It has no instructions. So we take for granted society's ability to take their understanding of one thing and apply it to another thing functionally for granted to such an extreme level that the most common product in the world doesn't actually come with instruction. So when you turn an iPhone on, if you've ever done that or any smartphone, this is the same for, it takes you through some very basic instructions of setting the device up. It doesn't actually explain how you use it. You're expected to know how to do that because you've either owned a smartphone before or a telephone before, or you have used a computer. And the expectation is you will be able to just use this device using all your pre-existing knowledge of how those things work and apply it to this device. And for most people, that kind of works. Most typically developed neurotypical people are able to do that. I mean, if you've ever tried to sit with an elderly relative and, and get them to work smartphone on Christmas morning or something like that, you know, it's not that easy. Um, but it's absolutely like taken for granted to such an extreme level that that's how this product works. What I'm interested in or what we became really interested in is what about if you're autistic? So we were looking at that web and how we build schema where we take information and we start slotting it together and we make connections about how this thing influences that. And we modify our pre-existing schemas that way. So we start off with a very basic understanding of something. And as we learn a new piece of information, we add that in to our pre-existing web of information and it alters what the web looks like. It alters what our understanding of that thing is. It starts to become more complex. It, it's the reason why experts learn faster than novices. There's sometimes a lay misconception that because novices are presented with a vast amount of information, they are learning really fast. But actually, once you already have a very complex understanding of something, you can learn at a much faster rate. And you will see this in classrooms. You will have certainly seen it in classrooms where people will talk about, ah, it's just clicked. They'll say that phrase. Oh, it just clicked. Everything just clicked into place. Well, that that's the point where the information has been properly organized. And you'll notice at that point, people, children, adults, whoever, will start to learn really, really fast. And that's because they they've built up a very robust schema of that subject now, when they tag in new information, it's just connected really fast and it modifies the schema and it builds super quick. Research suggests that people with autism do not easily modify their schema. They, they tend to store information in more linear schema and don't make those connections as readily and don't modify their schema as readily. The implication of this can be quite significant to somebody's learning. You think about if you're taking a set of information and every similar set of information has to be completely learned from scratch so that your schema look more like ladders of, inf of knowledge instead of webs, that obviously has implications for how useful and how readily you can access and use that information. If you work in a specialist setting like mine for children with severe learning difficulties and autism, you will have anecdotally come across this. You will absolutely have, unless you've only worked about two days. If you've worked more than a term, you will have at some point, if you have children with severe learning difficulties in autism, have anecdotally come across this situation where, for example, they can count one specific resource and then not another. So I have taught children, for example, like I, I often use, I have a brilliant example. It's the clearest example that I have in my career of a boy that I used to teach you. Could, we used to have these little monkeys that like had little M-shaped arms and they all hooked together. You can make these long chains of monkeys. They were blue, these blue monkeys. And I had a child who could count 
any amount of these blue monkeys. I'm pretty sure if I could have found enough blue monkeys, you probably could have counted to a thousand. And I, there was certainly one day where we got to about 42 or something like that in the blue monkeys. And I'm like saying, oh, go and get, see if anyone else has got blue monkeys, go next door, like find this other teacher. They've got, I'm sure they've got blue monkeys downstairs, go and see if they've, and we were like adding in more of these monkeys and he's getting up to bigger and bigger numbers. And he got up to, went until we ran out of blue monkeys, basically got up to about 76 blue monkeys, something like that. We had these big long chains all across the table. Anyway, this was in the morning. We got to snack time and I said to um, Ryan, just right there's like six of us here today ryan and there's two staff just uh get eight cups and ryan just came back with like, an armful of cups and i was like no that you don't need 15 cups ryan just you just need eight cups because there's like the six of you and then we've got two two staff and then ryan came back with three cups and i said no ryan just count the cups like just get the and sent him back again. And then Ryan, and at this point, it was obvious Ryan was just guessing at how many cuts. And Ryan's like schema for counting was so rigid that he could count the blue monkeys, but he couldn't count how many cuts we needed at snack time. And they were just normal plastic kind of mugs with a handle and everything. Like, and it was to such an extreme level that he could count 72 of these blue monkeys and was dead proud of it, but he couldn't get the six cups. You know, eventually we got down to like just forget about the staff, just get the six cups for the for the the other children in the class. And he couldn't do it. At that point, you start a question, well, can if Ryan can only ever count blue monkeys that connect to each other, can he actually count? Is that functional? Can he use that in any way whatsoever? And what we were experiencing, I later learned and later realized. Was a very extreme version of this where he he basically could count the blue monkeys but he couldn't count and he wasn't applying that to any other context or domain there were throughout my career i have lots of less obvious less black and white less extreme examples of this as well but you will certainly have your own examples from classrooms where you've seen things like that where a child can do the thing in one specific context, in one specific way, but isn't able to do exactly the same thing when it's just subtly altered or moved to a different part of the school or with a different medium or something like that. And that's, you know, the, there is good evidence that children and people with autism do not readily modify their schema in the same way that um, neurotypical people do. That obviously leads to kind of a disordered development that's less reliable, which in turn leads to this. So there's something unique about the, when I was taking my class to the Tesco's, um, this is a safe way, I think, in this picture, but it's we were going to Tesco's. There was something really interesting about that because they could read. So they were they had basic reading skills, certainly had sight reading skills, weren't brilliant with phonics, um, probably couldn't blend and segment particularly well, but certainly had really good kind of personalized and functional sight reading could read the main words they needed to we taught them that in school and they were able to recognize things like toilet exit and the keywords on their shopping list and stuff like that well what's really interesting about the supermarket is yeah they move the shelves around every few months um so that people like me will have to wander around with my trolley and i end up impulse buying a load of cereal i didn't need but it's one of the only environments in the world. There's a few environments like this, but the supermarket is one of them. And certainly if you remove things like airports and train stations that you might not access every single day, it's one of the only daily accessed environments that has a certain feature to it. And it's really interesting because the key words that were on my pupils shopping list that were listing off what they had to find in the shop are hanging in giant font from the ceiling of the shop. There is an aisle that says, just has the word bread in foot high letters hanging above it. Annoying we don't have that on this picture, but it does. We have jams, jars, you know, sauces hanging from the ceiling. We have dairy hanging from the ceiling. We have all of those things. The key words that the child needs is hanging from the ceiling. Were my class, were my children able to take what they'd learned in class, their sight learned words, and functionally apply them to a different environment? 
they would have been able to problem solve their way around the supermarket without getting angry that the cereal was now where the marmite used to be because they could have looked up and seen, oh, it says jars, jams, and spreads hanging from the ceiling, or it says bread down here, and they could walk to that aisle. It's it's a real life example of not being able to cross contextualize and functionally apply your learning. So that's where play comes in. Play is one of the single most powerful types of learning, teaching and learning for all sorts of skills, all sorts of abilities, all sorts of things. One of the strongest things it does is develop our ability to problem solve and cross contextualize. When we're playing, we're never usually playing in just one singular domain. We're usually doing several things at once. We're taking literacy, we're taking number, we're taking various aspects of our understanding of the world and we're applying it to different settings, different spaces, different resources, different objects, different activities. And I'm going to go on now and talk about specifically how we do that at Sunningdale and why we do some of the things we do and which pits of play we focus on and talk about some areas of play. But this is the reason that play is so important to us is all that contextual information. We want to develop learners that are able to functionally apply their skills to the real world so they can tolerate uncertain situations, situations that are fluid or moving or changing or have changed that don't look like they usually do, that change to something else. We want them to be able to tolerate that and navigate that. We want them to be able to know what to do when they don't know what to do. We want them to be able to apply their knowledge. So how do we do that? First thing we do is we focus on the types of play that we're going to develop with the children. So what you've got on your screen is something we sometimes share with the staff at Sunningdale and we, we kind of um, talk about a lot in the classrooms. And that is you have running up the y-axis, you have the social stages of play, and across the bottom there, you've got the cognitive types of play that we might be looking for with the children. Now, if you're wanting to look these up, and you wanted to find them somewhere, they are, we use partners, social stages of play. So the social stages going down the y-axis or up the y-axis are from parton, the research of parton, and the cognitive types of play are the cognitive categories of play going across the bottom of from Smolansky. So they're really well-known researchers, generally well accepted. Most research to do with play is bedded in their types of play that they develop. And Smolansky, in particular, as cognitive stages of play are developed very closely out of um, Piaget, but I'll talk about why we're not as interested in how Piaget defined those areas of play in a moment, but I'm going to talk you through these stages of play and why they're so important to us at Sunnydale and why you might be looking for those. So in terms of the types of learners that we work with, we'll talk about the social stages of play first, um, because that's something we put a lot of emphasis on, particularly with our most complex learners. I'll talk slightly less about the cognitive stages of play, but I'll still go through that and explain how we might go about that and, and what we look for. But one of the first things we might encounter with some of our more complex learners is that actually they're just not taking part in any kind of predictive behavior. The first thing we want to do is develop, develop their ability to play solitarily. We just want them to play. So we have some learners that won't play at all. They just, you know, they're not interested in the kind of environment around them. And they're not interested in any kind of physical play or kind of object play, you know, not even exploring an object in any way whatsoever. So some of our more complex children are quite content to be like that. What I'm going to go on to describe after I've described each of these stages is how we develop them into solitary players and then onlooker plays. So... The reason, though, that it's important that we want them to start playing is because they'll develop some of the skills that we're talking about, as well as we're going to use play to teach them all sorts of things about literacy, number, and everything. However, once we've got them as solitary players, what we want to develop is somebody who's an onlooker. So the reason that we're so interested in that as well is that we want them to be interested in what somebody else is doing. So I work with a lot of children here at Sunningdale who have severe learning difficulties and autism, and a very they may play and they may explore their environment and i'll explain how we set that up 
um, in a moment, but they're, they're sometimes, at least at first, not very interested in anybody else. You know, they're on their own agenda and kind of not really that interested in what anybody else does or why they might be doing it or anything like that. If we can develop that, we want to be able to develop that interest in somebody else playing, so another child, another activity or whatever it is, we want to move them into that. If we can move them beyond that into parallel play, when we start to talk about parallel play, what we're talking about is a child who will play either next to another child or with a resource immediately adjacent to another child. It could be the same resource, could be a different resource. For some of our children with very complex needs, this is huge. To be able to play in parallel where they will tolerate another child in their personal space or an adult, even child or adult in their personal space. For some of the children that attend our school is quite a big step. It's excellent that they'll do that. And they're starting to tolerate others. They're tolerating the demand being put upon their, their personal space. And they're starting to tolerate others in their personal space. And that can be quite a big social step for them. When, when I start to talk about associative play, what I'm actually talking about is where two children are working on the same activity, the same resource, the same object, the same whatever, um, but they're not actively working together. So a really good example of this might be where you've got two children, for example, playing with Lego. They might both be playing with the same Lego set. They might, in the middle of the, the kind of Lego mat, they could be building a house and they're just putting bricks on the walls, on the house, not really talking to each other, not watching what each other are doing. But one of them's building the walls on their side of the mat. The other one's building walls on their side of the mat. They're associatively playing. They're, they're associating with each other. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're just not actively collaborating. They're not working together to build the house, but they're both building the house. It's that kind of thing. And um, you will see this with blocks, towers, those kind of things quite a bit, where children just kind of start putting things on top of the tower. They're not, they haven't asked the other child's permission. They're not really like working together or you put this one there you put that one there they're just kind of oh, i'm just going to put one on there put one on there they're not even waiting for the other child's turn they're just sticking them on the tower but they are playing associatively they're doing the same thing they're starting to play together even though they're maybe not collaborating when we get to cooperative play we're talking about children who are actively collaborating so at that point they they might be verbally communicating they may not be verbally communicating but we're talking about children who are starting to actively like work together to develop something in their play. So this could take place in terms of something when I go across the cognitive stages in dramatic play, socio-dramatic play, where they might be acting out something from the home or like pretending they're in a restaurant or something like that. They're both playing different roles and they're actively kind of interacting with each other towards a function, the function of the role play, or it could be much more kind of constructive play-based or conditional play-based where they're starting to, you know, they're building that Lego house, but actually one of them is like, you know, they're kind of, they're building their side of the house. They hand the door frame to the other child. They put that in their space and then they are passing bits to each other or they're like starting to build the roof together. One of them's directing the other one. That is true. They're starting to collaborate. They're not just kind of throwing this thing together. Same as it becomes in the cognitive stages, it would be, again, if we stick with dramatic play, you could have two children playing in the, the kind of the home area of the classroom or like what we have at Sunningdale, they're both in the doctor's surgery. They could both be kind of actively playing in that. That would just be associative play. But once one starts to take on the role of the doctor and the other the patient and they're actively like collaborating with each other in that role play, that would be cooperative play. These social stages of play is super important for a lot of the children in our school. So for children with severe learning difficulties and autism, obviously a big, quite a big developmental deal for a lot of our children is that they start to actively kind of tolerate other people. They accept being on other people's agendas or parts of other people's agendas. They're able to communicate their own agenda. They're able to communicate their own needs at the same time as accepting the needs of somebody else. And like, if they get to the point where they're collaborating, this is absolutely massive for a lot of our children. But actually for quite a cohort of our children, 
we're just interested in are they interested in what somebody else is doing and will they tolerate somebody else kind of using their resource or being in their space that might be quite a big step for some of our younger children so that's the social stages of play and actually sometimes what we ask staff to think about is rather than thinking of them as stages of play they're almost just social stages of interaction if we can move a child through those stages of interaction their their social and emotional skills are really kind of increasing exponentially as they move through those they're quite big leaps as they move through each of those stages of play if I, then I'm going to briefly go on to the cognitive stages of play and just describe some of those and why we're interested in those. So practice play, um, or what sometimes you will see as referred to as functional play. I We don't call it functional play here at Sunningdale just because we talk about functional play in a slightly different context when we get into that preparation for adulthood and being able to, you know, so we use number in the shop. We want that to be functional. The use of the child's number needs to be functional. Their literacy needs to be functional. And that's how we talk about functional play. So we use, we actually use Smolansky's other description of practice, uh, which is practice play instead of functional, just to stop confusion. They tend to get used interchangeably. At earlier stages, this is just, we want a child to develop physical play, especially if they have a profound learning difficulty and we want them to be taking part in object play. So this is the early exploration. If you're a school that uses the engagement model, for example, this would be your very early exploration of objects and resources and starting to kind of explore what they do and what they might do. Now, we do that with our children here at Sunningdale, and I will talk, I'm going to talk all about how we make these opportunities for the children in a second. I just want to get through each of the types of play first so that people have a bit of context to that. Physical play is what it is. So that's your movements, that's starting to, you know, exert an influence on the environment around you. Once we get into conditional or constructive play, it's that's taking that exploration of the object a little bit further. So again, if you're a school that uses the engagement model, this would be starting to think about realization. So exploration turning into realization. So you're not just kind of seeing that object, grabbing that object, you know, kind of playing with that object in its singular use. You're starting to explore what it really does, like what are the conditions of that object? So what does it do? What else is it like? What, you know, this thing works like this. So, you know, this thing is a, because this is spherical, it'll spin and bounce like a ball. This ball, you know, this other thing that's spherical, will that spin, will that bounce, you know, will that do this? If I press this switch, that turns that on. Hang on, this has got a switch. That's probably going to, like that kind of explorative, um, what would be seen as developing realization in the, um, the engagement model. What we would then start to see is also constructive play. So it starts to, that's some of those examples I was giving in the social stages around the use of Lego and building things and those kind of, those activities, you know, tough spots full of sand or tough spots full of like um, molding groups and all of your kind of great sensory activities and, and the use of those. When we start to talk about dramatic play or pretend play, it is kind of what it sounds like. So it's, you're getting into role plays, um, you're getting into acting out at first, the earliest form of that would be your real life, um, your kind of real life replication of things. So you get, you go to bed every night. It might be that the nighttime routines are for the child would be they have a bath, they get a song sang, and then they go to sleep. And when you see them kind of replicating that in the classroom and starting to replicate those um those home routines, that's that's the beginning of pretend play. Where constructive play starts to move into pretend play is you start to see the child use objects for other uses. So the, the classic example of that would be, as probably lots of people will have experienced from their, their own children, their husbands, their boyfriends, whoever, is using the Christmas wrapper, the cardboard out of the middle of the Christmas wrapper that suddenly becomes a lightsaber and the person starts running around you know, making lightsaber noises and charging around the living room, hitting people with the, the cardboard tube. That's your kind of 
that's constructive play where you've understood that that role might have multiple uses, starting to move into pretend play and dramatic play. It becomes obviously socio-dramatic play where that's with somebody else. So you might be, for example, socio-dramatic play, as I've talked about a couple of times already, might be something like you're making the tea. One person is the person sat at the table. The other person's in the kitchen making tea, asking them, do you want a cup of tea? Do you want milk in that? You know, bringing them over like plates of stuff, whether that be plastic food that you've got in your, your nursery or your classroom or whatever. Or, you know, if it's more functional, it might be real stuff. Games with rules is exactly what it sounds like. It's games with rules. So this might be physical games with rules. So things like TIG and TAG and uh, those kind of games. It can also obviously be board games and, and games that have kind of your basic kind of snakes and ladders games. Going all the way up into more complex games, like at the top end of that, you would have games that have strategy. So things like chess, um, you know, you might have, I have a colleague that plays Warhammer, which is, you know, a game with little miniatures that fight these battles. Incredibly complex, like books and books of rules involved in that game. Very complex game with rules. But probably given that we're in the context of a special school and children with severe profound multiple learning difficulties and autism, we'll be talking about very basic board games that have very simple rules, or it might be physical games that you play kind of in a playground or in sports hall and that kind of thing. So in terms of the types of play, this is what we're talking about. This is how we ask the staff at Sunnydale School to think about where is the child in terms of their, their play development and what do we need to do to move them to the next stage? As I was saying before, incredibly important that we start to move our children through those social stages of play. We want them to be interested in other people. So we want to develop onlooker play um, and then we want, if we can, to move them into parallel play where they'll play alongside somebody else, tolerate somebody else in their space. And if we can get them where they're bothered about working together, that's brilliant. In terms of the cognitive stages of play, exactly the same thing. We do want them to develop all of those stages. If you get to the point where you have someone who is able to play games with rules and play cooperatively, so essentially on that grid, they're, they're ticking the box in the top, what on my screen, I'm not sure if it'd be the same on your screen, but what on my screen is in the top right-hand corner of that box, that purple square where cooperative play hits games with rules. If you can get a child or a young person to that point, you essentially have somebody who is able to function in a community as part of a society. They're able to follow rules. They're able to understand what rules are. They're able to apply them to the situation they're in. And they're able to give up their agenda as somebody else. They're able to cooperate with somebody else towards a common goal. So that, you, that actually, if you think about it, that is what a typically kind of successfully functioning adult can do. They can follow the rules that are expected of them whilst at the same time cooperating with others and allowing for others' agendas to impact their own, to give up their own kind of some of their own ideas and freedom to be able to be cooperative with somebody else. That is a functioning kind of successful member of society. Quite a lot of typically developed adults do not always do this successfully, but it's this is what we're aiming for with our children is to get them to where they can cooperate as well as follow rules, but understand rules and not follow rules because they've been trained into that, but just have an understanding of this is how this thing is going to work. So this is when we're talking about the stages of play. I did promise that I would mention uh, Piaget slightly. Smolansky, as you'll notice, the cognitive stages of play are they're reflective in Piaget's kind of stages of development. I think the reason we don't talk about Piaget is because we see the importance of separating out these social stages and cognitive stages the importance of the social stages is massive to us with our children with severe learning difficulties and autism. And what you will find if you read Piaget's work, which is obviously earlier work to these researchers that developed beyond him and took his ideas and developed them further, is he conflates the two things together. So often you have parallel play as part of concrete operational, for example. But what research does suggest, and certainly we've seen anecdotally, is these stages aren't necessarily going to come on that in that kind of sequence. So we have children who can do 
dramatic play, who will take part in dramatic play and pretend play, and even sometimes games with rules, who still aren't really great at parallel play. They still won't play in parallel to somebody else. They're still just very much an onlooker, they, if, if at all that, and they're just on their own agenda. So it's that's where you start. The separation of social stages of play and cognitive types of play becomes really useful to you in, in looking at this and how you might develop these stages for your pupils. That's why we don't kind of focus on those simpler, more complicated versions that Piaget uses. So how do we do this? I'm going to talk about how we plan for our children a little bit to make sense of this. And I have some copies of that planning on the, the screen at the minute, but I am going to come back to that. I'm going to move on from that for a second and explain how we set up the environments at Sunningdale to actually facilitate some of what I've been talking about. If you've used the engagement model, you will have come across the areas of engagement. If you're working in a specialist setting for children with severe and profound learning difficulties, you should obviously be aware of this by now. What I've got on the, the board is, is on the board on the screen is how we communicate the or how we record the um, areas of engagement here at Sunningdale. So we do this qualitatively in terms of exploration, realization, anticipation, persistence, and initiation. We've been using engagement for a really long time. Actually, when I was reflecting on this the other day, I realized we've been using it for 10 years ish at this point, just under 10 years. Um, we originally used the Barry Carbon uh, aspects of engagement that were published in 2009 and then 2011. And we then went on through all the various pilots and the various versions of engagement that came through the Rochford Review and the work of Diane Rochford with her team. And then we have, we have obviously now the statutory areas that we use in the model. One of the things that we found when we were working with all those versions of engagement is that at a very early developmental level, this information is really useful. What does somebody's realization look like? What does their anticipation look like? How can we use that? And what does that look like? What we found more useful was information that was actually coming out of the observations of these things. So as you start to observe somebody's exploration, you start to mine or notice really, really interesting information about what motivates them. So as you look at somebody's persistence or exploration, you start to realize it's always this kind of resource. It's always this kind of activity. It's always in this room. It's always at this particular time. It's, it's always with this type of support or this type of person. And over a prolonged period of time, you start to realize there's more useful information in these observations than just what somebody's exploration looks like or their anticipation looks like. There's information in here that we could use to draw these children that don't engage particularly well into their learning environments. And beyond that, even use it to start developing their type and social stages of play beyond where they currently are. So what we started recording was the resources and objects they best persist with or engage with, we, the activities where that happens, the rooms or types of environments where that happens, the times of day and events where that happens, and the types of support that that, that they require to do that. When we very first work with a child, what we do is we record this at a very basic level. So the resources might just be listed. It might be a few resources that we just list. Oh, it's this, 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 and this. Same with activities. The rooms, it might be a specific room. It's 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 room X. It's, it's the sound room. It's the sensory room. It's this sensory room or that sensory room. It's the hall. It's the classroom. It's whatever. Same with the times of day. What are the times of day they best engage at? Is it always just before lunch? Is it always just after lunch? Is it always in the afternoon? Is it always in the morning? You get the idea. We would record all of that kind of basic information. What we actually then do over time is we start to try and analyze what is the connecting thing between that information. So if we, if we have a list of five resources, we start to try and work out what is it about those five resources? What is it schematically or at a process level or whatever it is at a sensory level that is starting to connect those resources? Because if we know the five resources, that's kind of useful for the first few weeks. We know that we can use those resources to encourage a child to engage in play. Um, but if we start to understand what it is about them, at say a schematic level or a sensory level, we can find lists and lists of resources that share those qualities. 
we can start to demonstrate those to the child. And then we have a much broader range of um, resources and objects that we can share with the child to try and draw them into their learning. We can expand their world, increase their interests. And we try and do this with activities, rooms, environments, times of day, and types of interaction and people. So as we start to take those things deeper, we, we were presented with a greater range of those things that we can use. In terms of rooms and environments, it's really important because we can't use the same room. If it's a very specific room in the school, we probably can't get the child there all day, every day. But what we can do is look at the qualities of that room or, or the list of rooms that we have. Is it that they're all small? Are they all very well lit? Is the lighting very low? Are they really big rooms? Like, are they noisy rooms? Are they quiet rooms? What are the environmental factors of the room? And trying to analyze that and look at what it is about that. Same with the times of day. Um, we did have an example where a child engaged really well at kind of about 20 to three every day. And we were obviously stuck at a point where we we're like, well, we can't do everything at 20 to three every day. You can't shoehorn somebody's entire school career into 20 to three till three o'clock every day. What is happening at 20 to three? We actually realized that that particular child um, worked better when there were less adults in the room. So we had the adults were doing taxi runs, starting to take children out of their transports that were collecting them. And what we found was actually it didn't matter how many children were in the room or what else was going on. But if there was less adults in the room, that child was more focused. And so it's looking at the qualities of what's happening at that time of day, because you can replicate that at other times. Same with types of interaction and people get a lot of children who interact really well with one or two members of staff. Well, it's not really practical that they do everything with one person all of the time or two people all of the time. It's what is it about how those people interact with them? Are they very animated? Are they not very animated? Do they use a lot of sign language? Do they use no sign language? Are they very um, kind of non-verbal communicators? Are they very expressive with their kind of faces, their hands, their bodies? Or is it the opposite of that? If we can analyze that and work out what that is, lots of everybody can interact with the child in that way. And so it's starting to try and analyze that information. I've got on your handouts that hopefully you've been sent a bit of an explanation of how we try and get that information deeper in terms of each of those things. So resources and objects, activities, with some examples on those slides. Um, we would talk about play schema. I'm going to come back to this. Um, rooms and environments times of day and events and you support and interaction. I've got examples of that on all of the, the slides that you should have. And that's how we build these. That's how we build these engagement motivator profiles for every child in every class in the school. And that is that is what we use to try and then start developing a child through their stages of play. So if I go back very quickly, we're nearly at the, we've got 15 minutes to go, but if, if I talk about trying to take a child who plays very solitarily, and how do I develop onlooker play for that child? How do I get them to be interested in what somebody else in the room is doing? Well, at Sunningdale, the way we do that is we take this information, we set up the activities in the classroom, using this information for the anywhere between we have our smallest class has four children our largest class has nine so you'll combine this information for the children in the class you'll set up activities across the classroom that share these qualities for the children in the class and then we will allow the children to go and engage with those activities or the adults might even engage with those activities to model how they might be used and we develop, we use it very specifically to start developing these skills. So in terms of say the social stages, if we have somebody who we know is a solitary player, but then we know we've taken the essence of the resources and activities that they we know they best explore with, and they're over say on the other side of the classroom and another adult or another child is engaging with those, we're doing that very specifically on purpose to try and develop onlooker play. We want them to be interested in that. We know they're going to be motivated by those types of activities that share those schematic or sensory qualities or that kind of resource or with that type of adult interaction or pupil interaction. We're going to try and draw them into being bothered about that, being interested in that. The same principle applies for how we would then draw the child into parallel play. If we know we have two children 
who are highly motivated by this type of specific activity or this type of specific resource. And we set that up where they're going to have to play next to each other in order to access that. We're going to develop parallel play for those children, which then becomes them tolerating other people in their space, tolerating people using the same resources them, and starts to develop those skills. And you can see how we then use that information to kind of start developing those skills. Same as we move a child from constructive, um, sorry, practice play in a conditional or constructive play. So we want them to explore. If we want somebody to further explore how a resource works or the multiple uses of a resource, the simplest way, it's, it's not rocket science, the simplest way of doing that is to use resources and activities that we know are going to be highly motivating to them. If we want their conditional or constructive play to look at novel resources, if we then understand what links the type of resources or objects that they like playing with together, so we know what that is schematically or we know what that is from a sensory level, we can introduce new and novel resources to develop their conditional play, to develop their constructive play. That's how we're using that information to draw the children into those different types of play and develop their cognitive um, types of play, develop their repertoire of cognitive types of play, but also move them through their social stages of play as well through this use of what is motivating them and what are their motivators. In terms of their developmental um, understanding and moving their learning forward, that's where this other document comes in, which looks like this. Hopefully you can see that. That should also hopefully be a copy of that on your hand site. This is also on our website. We track really carefully where each child is developmentally across their cognition and learning, their communication and interaction, their social and emotional development and their physical or sensory development. And when we're setting up those activities in the classrooms, what we will do is pitch the activities at a level where we can scaffold some of these skills. So we set these intentions or outcomes so that they last somewhere in the region of 12 weeks. They're never able to last longer than that. So it's got to be kind of, a, it's a small step that we might expect the child to make in the next 12 weeks. And what we will do is as we're setting up those activities that we're using all of that motivating information to set up, we will then also bear in mind where developmentally do we want to be able to scaffold the child's learning or play of this activity or in this environment. And we will set up the activity so that we can do that. If you want to know, I mean, that is quite literally just Vygotsky and a Vygotsky and approach in, in the zone of proximal development. We're going to try and pitch the activity right at the edge of the child's zone of proximal development. So as soon as they start engaging with the activity, we're able to work on one of their learning intentions and take them into their development, take them into that next developmental step whether that be a communication and interaction step or a, so a cognition step in something like number or literacy, that's where we're going to pitch those activities. And that's where we're going to pitch their play and try and draw them into their play. That's how we do that. I did promise I would talk a little bit about schematic play. I've mentioned a few times like there may be a schematic commonality to the activities or the objects or the resources that the child is using or being um, drawn into. We do talk sometimes about play schema and um, this This is in terms of, well, like I've got on the screen there, Athi's definition of play schema. We're talking about a particular type of behavior, schematic behavior that the child is kind of um, locked into repeating and they're very motivated by. A typically developing child. This will help develop other schema, so it will gradually be assimilated into the other schema and can be coordinated and developed and grow to become more complex. What we do experience with a number of our children is that because they are developing maybe at a slightly lower level, possibly at a slower rate by, you know, by the very um, consequence of their learning difficulty, what we find is that sometimes they get a bit locked into the schemas that they they're motivated by now while knowing their play schema so something like trajectory schema which is at the top of that grid there where the child's sort of throwing things or what or like is very interested in the trajectory of objects and resources and that kind of thing or even themselves um what you might find is the child that manifests for the child in that they throw everything they like to throw everything well 
that can be useful to draw them into activities initially. I think with our children with um, severe learning difficulties and autism, we do have to be a little bit careful that we don't exacerbate that. If you think about what I was talking about um, earlier in terms of how we store information in our long-term memory so that it becomes useful to us in, in terms of Piaget's schema theory, um, what we're talking about is we don't want the child to become too locked into a linear type of schema where they just, that becomes exacerbated. So we might use our understanding of this to draw them into some activities, but we don't want their whole world to become about this very rigid type of play. So it's it's useful and understanding of play schema and how that works and what that might be for the child is certainly useful, but it's also something that has to be judged dynamically constantly of like, how useful is this? Do we want to use this? Do we want to continue to use this? Are we able to develop beyond this? Are we able to broaden this out um, rather than get stuck in a certain type of play with the child? That's something just to be very mi mindful of. Certainly something that you see in classrooms anecdotally quite a bit um, where the child's kind of locked into one way of um, engaging with a particular resource or activity. Okay, so I've gone through this. You do have this in the slides. Hopefully I've explained how we use that to facilitate play-based learning, um, how we set that developmentally for the level of the child. Some of this information is on our website um, as well as the handout we've hopefully got. So we've covered all of that. We've gone about, we've done just under an hour and a half. We've got about five minutes left if we're going to end this at five o'clock. Um, but What's this done for us? So over the years of doing this at Sunningdale, what we found when we moved to this and as we had some children learning through different ways um, of engaging with their environment, so less play-based, or as we've kind of run controls as we brought new children in and we've looked at their development versus before they were using a play-based approach to afterwards, what we found is this way of working sets a foundation for achievement. By setting up the environment in a way that is based on the class or the child's motivators, we're already setting a foundation for achievement. We've attuned the environment to the child. The next step is just for the adults in the room to be able to attune to them as well in terms of their communication and their behaviors and what is required from the interactions. But the environment's already setting the foundation for that. It's already attuned to the child. Because of that, what it does is it creates a kind of right time demand. So we're gonna draw the child into their learning, it means that at the point, you know, we're working with children who don't actually usually, at least to make a big generalization, um, not always true, but to, to make a bit of a sweeping generalization, we're talking about work, we work with children who don't tolerate demand particularly well, often don't have brilliant self-regulation strategies, and the triggering of their stress response system happens very, very easily. They're, the window or the space that they have to deal with the demand is very, very small. And sometimes something as little as a choice, do you want to do this or do you want to do that, is enough for them not to be able to cope with demand um, in terms of if we haven't really got time to get in this now. But if you think about how we manage stress and how our stress response system involves the release of adrenaline and cortisol, for example, and the impact that has on our body and our decision making, how um, when we're going through that chemical response, we start to lose access to full cerebral functioning, our memory becomes worse, we lose our expressive and receptive language to some extent. And we see this in typically developed children and adults all the time, but it's particularly prevalent for the people we work with. Well, by placing uh, the child in an environment that's already self-motivating, we're taking away some of the demand that we put on the child for them to engage with their learning. We're going to place that demand in the right place, which is them kind of acknowledging or accepting another child in their space or starting to work towards their developmental steps rather than just engaging in the first place. This approach gives the child increased agency. If you've done any research reading or really listened to anything about mental health, you will know that agency is the single biggest indicator of how good somebody's mental health is. So the more agency you have, as in the more kind of control and freedom you have over your environment and what's happening to you, the more robust your mental health tends to be, or at least that's what research suggests. 
Um, obviously, this gives increased agency to the child by its very nature. We setting up the child in an environment that is based on their motivators. It's going to draw them in. It's going to be played with. Um, we as a school see greater regulation because of this. We we have children. We have the most complex learners that exist. Very complex autism. Very low levels of cognitive development. We very rarely use any physical intervention. We went nearly two years at one point without using a single, with 140 children, 65 of which have complex autism and severe learning difficulties, and we didn't use physical intervention for at least 18 months. And actually, the only times we have used it in the last six months are for the child's own dignity and safety. We have a child who's stripped naked and runs around the playground. And he's had to be marched back in the building uh, for his own kind of dignity. Um, so it's, you know, we're seeing a massive increase in regulation from our children through this approach. They learn really fast because of that. When we compare them to before we fully embrace this way of working, um, our children make really fast progress. Um, statistically, although we don't use statistical analysis anymore in our assessment when at the point where we started doing this and we still did do a bit of that we saw children make roughly about a half more progress per year in terms of their developmental levels and the kind of skills they were picking up clearly uh, part of that is linked to them having better realization greater generalization we see great functional application of their learning and, and as a result what we hear from families is that they're, they're generally better able to cope with life beyond the school, uh, parents able to take children to shopping centres, restaurants, things like that. So we've seen a massive impact from this way of working. So uh, certainly here, I can say that we, we see the massive impact of it. If it's something you're thinking about for the right types of learners, it, it can be quite powerful or that's what we've seen. Where could you look to find out more about this? Well, there's certainly there's a book out at the moment um, that's just been recently published that talks, uh, has a couple of schools talk with a lot of the theory that underpins what I've said today and has some schools um, talking very, um, you know, operationally about how they set this up and how this is facilitated for their pupils, um, which is called the Different View of Curriculum and Assessment for Severe, Complex and Profound Learning Disabilities, which was published by Routledge at the end of last year. Um, and specifically what I've talked about today is the con is the actual content of the seventh chapter. There's also some research coming out from the Laurel Trust about how effective engagement-based play is, um, which involves ourselves and some other schools that are, is being published at the end of this year, at the beginning of 2025. Um, that is, uh, if you're really interested in Sunningdale specifically, we do have a YouTube channel um, and you can find out more about the school there. There are a lot of news videos on that channel that kind of are parent news videos. This is how we share news with our parents. If you can be bothered to sit through those videos and um, go through the messages that are saying like, oh, we break up on Friday the 23rd of whatever, and we come back to school on the 8th of January or, or whatever the message is, there are in every single one of those news videos we go into classrooms and you can see the practice in the classrooms. There were clips of classroom practice and the play-based learning that might happen in the different pathways. There are a couple of videos that are bigger ones like that do just have lots of the learning in the classroom and a more curriculum based. So there's that as well. That's kind of everything that I was going to cover today. I know it's been a lot of information in a very short space of time. These are the school's DLs. Um, we do run a range of other training sessions that might have more to do with play, might have more to do with engagement. We run development days for people that want to visit the school. Um, we just do that because we had so many people wanting to visit the school that we weren't able to cope. We were having visitors, you know, several, a couple of schools every single week. So it was becoming a bit unmanageable. So we group schools together on these development days the benefit of that to the schools that visit is then meeting other schools that are also, you know, it's a good networking opportunity. Everybody on those days shares practice and we happily talk everybody through everything we do in the school and we get to spend time in classrooms and stuff like that. So if that is something you're interested in, um, they're on the Senhub page, um, which 
presumably know how to get to because that's how you will book this. That's it from me today. I hope that's been useful. I can hang around for the next sort of five to 10 minutes. If anyone's got questions, you can either unmute, you can ask me the questions or you can stick them in the chat and I'll, I'll cover whatever, whatever anybody asks. Otherwise, if, if you want to go, that's fine. And thank you very much for, for your time and your interest.